22% of Americans are invisible, meaning they don't have any credit profile. Of that 22%, right? Only 1% of 1% will ever buy a home in their lifetime. What happened in the, the world of the Fed and the, in that world while I was, you know, going around to different booths and, and sitting in on a lot of different um, breakout I the, sessions? I guess the real key that's, that we're going to be talking about coming up is not what, not what, not what, is, not what did the Fed do? Because everybody already knows what the Fed did. What, what are they not going to do over the course of the next six months? And, and uh, what could they be doing? Because I, I, it looks like that they've, pretty much indicated that they're that these massive hikes are are have pretty much stopped but we're not really too sure what is going to happen because the you know that with the economy shutting or the government shutting down and then with the united auto workers strike that could be causing some inflation because you know they're striking to, to get some wage inflation going for themselves uh, because of the cost of goods that are being sold and so on and so forth so could we have could we have inflation plus uh, um, you know some extraordinary uh, recessionary items with lack of spending that that comes with that? So could we see could we see some uh, could we see the the real estate recession go a little bit further with inflation coming and a little bit of stagflation coming with uh, with increasing prices and re- and it's just. Very interesting to see, you know, what is going on. And so let's 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 actually gravitate from economic news over to digital mortgage because I think that what's super interesting to me right now is that you know as we as as you and I we talk to leaders of independent mortgage bankers, uh, and there is a hesitancy to go invest more into infrastructure. What is what are the some of the things that you think that that you've heard so far? that needs to happen and to invest in the infrastructure in order to reduce the cost of infrastructure for the future or increase um, the, the, the amount of originations, which means that basically increasing refinances in the future, increasing second mortgages in the future, or just an, an increasing profitability for independent mortgage bankers and brokers alike. So yeah, what great, are some great, of the, great question. Um, so the digital mortgage, the big takeaway was First, we got Mark Calabria and um, the chief economist from National Mortgage News Daily. The amount of treasuries that has had to be sold is what is driving up rates. And the fact that more bank failure could possibly be on the way. And they mentioned one of the recent ones where there were no buyers. So the government really had to come in and spend all that money, meaning they had to sell more uh, MSRs. And so that is what is causing you know rates to go up he, he sort of predicted that rates will be going up for a while and that banks believe that somewhere along the lines there'll be a dip in rates and then around t- between 26 and 28 it'll be the great reset meaning housing prices will go down significantly there'll be a housing crash and so banks well, oh, are wait, 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 staying wait, wait. away from the who said the, that the, I can get the name in a second, but I don't want to trail off here. The chief economist for the uh, National Mortgage News. All right. All right. And so what he was saying, though, is conventional loans are there for the IMBs. In fact, Mark Calabria thinks they should increase the LLP um, to make more money, Uh, the GSEs, to get themselves out of conservatorship. You know, it's very difficult for them to, to work with the CEO constantly being micromanaged. And if it was him, he would just raise the GSE fees. People are going to have to pay a you know, higher rate now, but it would allow them to get out of conservatorship. Uh, that's obviously a debate for a different day. Yes. Um, or maybe today. For sure. Just, maybe. We'll see. It was interesting. So a lot of the talk was, okay, so outside of the coast to coast where you have higher balance loans that the banks do want, those conventional loans that they sell to Fannie and Freddie are really going to belong to the IMBs. And with that, you know, there's also going to be a lot more repurchase risk going on. Um, I think I saw uh, in another panel I was in with Fanny, Freddie, and uh, Ginny. Quick shout out, Brian. Uh, um, in the audience, Brian was on my FHFA Velocity team. 
and um, Pippin from the FHFA actually talked about our um, idea or our presentation as one that they were thinking about implementing, looking into implementing, or just maybe not looking into implementing, but it was the first one that was brought up as an idea of something that could change. For those that don't know what it was, it was the ability to really hashtag data or think about how everybody came together, all the browsers came together in the early 2000s and allowed you to have a H or a secure HTTP so that they could say if Amazon did Amazon.com, it said, yeah, that's real Amazon. Um, and all the browsers came together and it ended up working out well. Same idea would be in the data. So if you get single source data from somewhere on a bank statement, it has a hash on it. That means it has not been touched since. That was our presentation. Wasn't wow effect as you know a lot of the consumer based products. Um, but really, she brought that up as they wanted to keep bringing up the fact that they are doing FHFA velocity. They're trying to find ways get adoption up the big talk is that you know that's single source data and so there was another one on there was a lot on data in general around marketing which was super cool and then there was one on using data to offer new programs and one of the biggest ways i had was okay so imbs are going to have to do the fha and the g in the, the fannie and freddie till 2028 or that's their opportunity and so there's only okay. so many fannie listings i think they also pre predicted, they had another economist that predicted an extremely low amount of purchases next year. I think there's only going to be 3 million. When you say purchases, do you mean now? Like, like retail residential housing purchases? Like there's only yeah. 3 million units for all originators nationwide to, to be looking Not at. Not originators, for all realtors. I mean, originators probably even less, right? Yeah, because some of them are going to be cash or hard money or non-QM or something, right? Yep. Can, can we break down what you just literally just talked about? You you actually unpacked a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't, but I, I didn't want to stop you because you were on a roll. Well, so uh, unpacking the first part, you're talking about hashtag data, right? So what what so can you can you explain a little bit more uh, for the for me as a non uh, as a non techie person? <laughs> what you know, when you say hashtag data, do you mean like? I mean, I know hashtag data. Uh, so, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best, but it was very techy for me too. We had, we had some brilliant people on our portal or our sure. team, I should say. Um, yeah. What does that the mean in idea English? Is you would have a centralized group. It would have to be some sort of nonprofit. Okay. Or, I mean, really, it was government backed. That was the one thing about the velocity that was kind of a, um, kind of the point of it, but also kind of a that we're just giving the government more ways to track us right uh -huh. um but that was it like okay so somebody's got to be it's probably gonna have to be a government mandate and so if say you pull form free and you get the the checking single source data all right the idea is that would come with a, a secure hash to it uh meaning a code right that is good until somebody changes it so as long as nobody messes with it, you know that you have something that was pulled from a place that is usable in, in underwriting a mortgage, which doesn't exist today. Does, um, that, uh, does that take away from day one certainty or does that improve day one certainty? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Day one, well, day one certainty is the act of waiving it. So however right. you got the data coming in, could be a work number from Equifax, could be, but the idea is it's just being said that the source is what it does is Fanny goes through yes to answer your question actually you kind of nailed it so Fanny goes through a process to get appraisal companies to qualify to get income companies the new big ones Halcyon's coming but Halcyon does not do Fanny it's going through Freddie Mac the idea is they wouldn't have to go through each one once it goes to a central place then those hashes are, you know mark that this data is a good source and can be used and then freddie and fanny don't have to go through this long process of um individually accepting them vetting them etc it also says it's a way to verify like yeah that actually did come from form free in case say it's a broker that pulls it gives it to uwf they deny it and then they twist it and go to a another place with it um 
you know, they don't have to re-pull form free through another system. The hash would say it's okay. How is that streamlining for if you're an independent mortgage banker, how is that making things easier for you or reducing costs? It reduces about sixteen hundred dollars actually on um the amount spent on checking the check. I mean, even is I think a, they said something that, like does that does that eliminate any working positions? Like for any processors, doctors, um would it uh, eliminate pre, any working pre, positions? Any, pre technically day one certainty is supposed to eliminate it, but they haven't been able to figure out how to do it yet. So <laughs> Another piece that was brought up, I mean, there's so many interesting things at this conference. So another, you know, on this note, somebody else yeah. suggested that they see in the next eight years a, a technology system where the lender has the point of sale and all that up the funnel product, right? Okay. Once they're able to get the borrower through the point of sale, the meet parameters, the loan can essentially almost close and then be underwritten by you know three different parties and maybe there'd be obviously repurchases if it didn't work out but something along those lines where there's only like three companies in the country that really underwrite and operate and process loans and as a lender it's more about your operations becomes the point of sale technology and delivering it to a new capital markets type technology who, who's 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 writing the programs for this? I'm just curious. I'm I'm not that that side of that side of the world. I'm actually not so familiar with. So who's writing these programs? Is there what company is writing doing these that? programs? I think that will be probably be written by somebody. And um, there's already two out right now, but that'll you know that'll come from the that'll come from the capital markets marketplace and work its way back where they realize they don't really need they don't really need certain parts of the loan underwritten and delivered to them underwritten. They can use a face. Yes. Think of like appraisals in, in AMCs, right? Sure. I guess it'd be kind of like that. Like yeah, somebody's supposed to do the appraisal, but yeah. the mortgage company is just ordering it on a software now. And then, you know, Was anybody not only does the appraisal happen, but it gets injected into their, their operating software and they keep going. They don't have to write what? things down, do anything. It would essentially be the same thing. You, you put, you're almost taking the point of sale, and rather than putting it in your LOS, you're putting it into the marketplace. You know, ice, ice would probably be one of them. Yeah. What about black? <laughs> I mean, isn't that what they're trying to do right now? That you say it, mirrors and everything. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say uh, that. That sounds like a, another thing that Ice and Black Knight are are gonna enter into because it sounds like it sounds like a, a profit center. <laughs> A, yeah, a, a it does. Um, a monopoly profit center, I should say. <laughs> I, I thought one of the cool ones is they talked about new like loan programs that could be out there. Very cool. So, when you say loan programs, are you talking about like down payment assistance, or are you talking about like interesting adjustable rate mortgages? Are you talking about I, like define yeah, all, all like, of that? They had a really good one. Um, Dominic who used to be at um, Loan Depot, CIO, but he's consulting. He had some good people up there, a gentleman named Lucky um, and um, David Abity at EF, who runs capital markets at Gill. So uh -huh. one cool fact is um, FHA. So you can actually manually underwrite FHA loans. and Right. But it's a pain. But... I mean, it's a real big pain because there's so much um, paperwork involved. But I think it's one that people have to start considering because 22%, one of the facts was 22% of Americans are invisible, meaning they don't have any credit profile. And the, Dave the Dave Ramsey listener is what you're saying. The Dave Ramsey listener, yeah. Well, Dave Ramsey I think doesn't believe in debt or anything like that. He believes you should cancel your credit cards. He doesn't even believe in debt. So that was, that's why I say the Dave Ramsey listener, but go ahead. So yes, the, the Dave Ramsey listener is exactly correct. So, but I just think it's more, you know, low to moderate income areas, et cetera. Um, and which could be Dave Ramsey listeners of that 22%, right? Okay. Only 1% of 1% will ever buy a home in their lifetime. If we don't fix the current system. And it kind of goes back to the main speak of Dan Burris, who's a futuristic, says the old saying is um, the activities that you use to get you here, like, you know, 
is what got you the results you get. I don't know. Do you know what that saying is? Something like that. <laughs> I, I think I, yeah, I think I've heard like things that are similar to that. Uh, I you know, but you know, I have to get what how it goes. Thought. If anybody wants to come up to the audience and tell me that saying is something like that. But he's basically like the the activities you did to get you here. Not only are going to get you here, but get you less less further now with with the way technology is. Meaning, sure. you keep doing the same thing. Not only are you going to get the same results, you're going to get the same results, but in half. Right, because that's where because, technology's going. Because seventy years ago, uh, a dollar then, you know, you know, if you if you go look at those things, you know, a gallon of milk was twenty five cents, a gallon of milk was fifteen cents, and then now it's like four dollars. But in relative terms, for the cost of housing, you're, the same dollar gets you i think it gets you like 50 percent less less buying power versus versus 70 years ago whereas you you might have more, a little bit more um money in dollars and cents but you have less buying power because of inflation and so those who have continue to have uh, will continue to have and those who have not will continue to have less <laughs> that's what you're right. saying right yeah, and but I mean, there are ways to manually underwrite them in FHA. FHA, you could get bank statements now and show rent. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, rental payments. You can show utility bills. There's actually guidelines out there. So I think you're going to see some. Or where I'm going to explore is: is there some problem? Is they become hundred page files? The um, they also talked about how DTI is such a another interesting fact is like DTI is. It feels like we'll be obsolete at some point. David, we'll be what? Just, they analyzed 3,000 loans over the last six years for performance. Okay. And he found um, your your revenue to the revenue going in your, into your checking account, if you use form free or a bank statement, compared okay. to your debt, your outstanding debt, is almost, or I think it was a little bit better of an indicator than credit, or I think 125% better of an indicator of default or not than credit. Or if your revenue is 125% of your debt, some, somewhere along those lines, it's a better indicator. He said DI like, is just so – here's three reasons why. One, taxes. Like Nobody pays with before-tax money. So you don't know if, what, if they're in Florida, that same person doesn't get taxed. And in Massachusetts, they have to pay 7% sales tax, right? I mean uh, income tax, right? Another one is health care. Some people pay health care. Some people have their job pay health. There's no, that's not. I would say the majority of, well, yeah, most W-2 employees right now are using before tax income to pay for uh, health care. Most people pay health care, but the point is not everybody. So it's, it's just the numbers kind of go again. And then. Um, does that mean that they're. Does that the other one was being generous or not. Like, there's significant tax implications and benefits, you know, obviously if you're married or not, and that's not factored into your gross revenue. So you what, just said overall, there, it just was, was horrible at predicting. Yeah. Was there ever a question that was asked to the panel? I'm sure those questions are answer sessions. But if I was there, I would have asked the question, hey, do you think there's ever going to be a time where if you're a self-employed borrower and you're willing to shell out the $700 for an audited profit and loss statement, right? So if, if, I sh if I'm self-employed and I show uh, $90,000 of 1120 income, but my actual in but my actual uh, my actual gross before expenses, let's say, was eight hundred thousand, and my actual expense was six hundred thousand, and then a hundred thousand of it I use for before tax income to pay for medical insurance, and maybe partial of my, you know, of uh, I paid myself rent and 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 electric and cell phone and auto and reimbursement for expense, you know. So I, you know, my maybe my maybe my ten forty doesn't show as much. Uh, and some of my and some of my other expenses were passed through. I just didn't report on a K one. So you know, it was so is an audited profit and loss where I can sit there and go, this is what I actually earned as a self employed business person. So I can actually so I can show that I have the ability to pay my mortgage because of the income that I that I actually bring in versus the income that shows up on my tax return. So I can reduce my taxable income. Is that, is well, that yeah? They had um, um, they had somebody from I think it's. Good question. They had um, somebody from M&T Bank on that same panel. And he said, you know, the, the loans are going to perform. Like, there's a lot of good loans in the non-QM space. Or, or you just said, the, coming up with programs like you just said, it's, it's getting the investors to buy it. And where 
the people in car loan, the car loan world and personal loan world have done well, where mortgage technically has not done as well, is really lay out all of the risk factors that could go cause default and how you would handle it. And I think that was his message. It's like, yes, that sounds awesome, this PL program, and it probably would perform well. And you know, investors should buy it. It's just how do you how do we get better as an industry with the financials? You know, capital markets people really dig deep into that whole you know, if you're gonna come up with that program, you really need to map out all of the the risks so that the regulators feel confident in it and the investors feel confident that the regulators are okay with it and i think that's where he said sometimes people fall a little or all the time fall a little bit short um m t themselves like understand it's a good loan but just is not doing portfolio right now they said they have one non-qm loan the rates are high and there's a lot of guidelines you have to meet to do it but the, you know there is some alternative there now, are you talking the about cool, like? Okay, here's a cool thing. Ready? Wait, 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 we just backtrack just on that same topic. Are we talking about doing like a non qm loan? Or are we talking about doing this? What you're talking about with MNT on the board and on that panel and stuff? Are they talking about adding this to the suite of Fannie Freddie products, or adding this to uh, to FHA uh, Gini type of uh, guidelines, or even or even having VA enter into this for those who are no longer in the military but ha but are self employed. So is this like an across the board uh, agency type of thing, a paper type of thing, or is this something more related to non-QM? I'm just curious because I didn't know the context of, of, of that panel. So <laughs> did I confuse you or did you understand the question? I don't really know what loan you're, I don't know, are you talking about the one you just came up with? Yeah, like for, for the, for the self-employed borrower and for the person that actually can afford to make payments, are they talking about changing Fannie Freddie guidelines for self-employed? That, that that let me simplify that question no no not at all no then how, then then this is going to be then this is going to be potentially a new wall street introduced program that there's going to be an investor for where self-employed can be I'm sure you just made it up. i didn't say any loan all i said was fha has manual <laughs> underwrite for the under yeah. the invisible and that okay. is one that imbs have to figure out a way to get good with or have to figure out a way with all these people losing jobs right in operations uh-huh can somebody figure out a way to make it not so laborious with a hundred pages and it's highlighters and highlighting, you know, that is the FHA play. The other piece that I found super interesting is, and I, I wish I could do the credit history on the phone. I mean, credit reporting. Sorry, I don't know. What, 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 like, what do you mean? So, like if you were to show us a credit, like, when you say credit history, what do you mean that? Because what would you like to show us? So for those of FICO, us who are like not, FICO think, one, FICO two came out. FICO. I was trying to Google it, but um, really, I think it's like I forget, like nine. Let's say like nineteen ninety four. FICO one comes out. Uh, nineteen ninety eight. FICO two comes out. I think okay. like two thousand two. FICO four. Two thousand eight. Yeah. Or 2006, FICO 5, 2014, I think FICO 8, and now they're releasing FICO 10 and FICO 10T. Now, FICO 10T is revolutionary in a way because it's trending, which means you can actually, it factors in the last 24 months, whereas FICO traditionally is just a score in time. But what was eye opening for everybody in the audience is FICO DU uses today when you run du guess what fico it uses you mean they're not using fico 10 they're not using fico 10 they're using go four what and guess what freddie mac's using oh, no. fico five so uh, think of how much innovation is there alone for technology to have du catch up to today's they're using old out of date really credit systems that were built when we operated different you know there was no lending club there was no apple wallet there was no that not all of this is based on so there's huge opportunity there they were talking about to um 
to innovate and to, I think where the innovation will be, this is like the lenders, right? Saying the innovation needs to be to help the invisible borrowers because that's 22% of the population that only one out of 1% will ever get a mortgage. So not only can you get those numbers up, but then we'll refinance, buy a house again. Actually, really cool story, really cool. So that they finish and David Habithy, um, capital markets, tall guy. Uh, yep. Looks the part, right? And um, he's yep. uh, Dominic asks him to share a story. So he shares a story with that he is a um, he is a reserve police officer in Pasadena, California. So his jurisdiction is like the projects. And even in his first year, twenty two years ago, he got shot at twice um, in, in the first. Year. And it's a very bad area. It's very much like Training Day, the movie where he'll go into yes. the the projects and he said a grandmother could be mugged 80 year old grandmother could be on the ground mugged very like tragic and nobody will say anything nobody will rat anybody out nobody will help anybody when, when he shows up um one day he's taking a report and this african-american gentleman is giving him um the details of of what happened and he's filling out a great report. He says, after I say to him, I said, well, can I ask you, the, why are you telling me all this? Every time I come down here, I'm never able to get information. And, I, and I'm very yeah. appreciative. You'll see that house over there? He goes, yeah. Because that's my house. I just bought it. And I want a neighborhood where people aren't smoking pot on the corner. I want a neighborhood without the graffiti. So David, who spent 22 years at Fannie Mae at the time, goes back to his office the next day. And he runs the address and looks it up, and he sees it, it's a Fannie Mae loan. An hour later, he's sitting there, and he's looking at a plaque on his desk that he had gotten a couple months earlier because in his second year, he came up with a program for lower to moderate income with Fannie Mae guidelines to help um, you know home affordable get into loans. And he got the award for coming up with the program and from a capital markets performed well. Look that up. And it that gentleman had gotten a home through the program that he created at Fannie Mae for that exact purpose. And so wow. he said it was really a spotlight on him and his life and his purpose, you know, of, of why we do this. And that is about homes. And when he goes back to Boulder, Colorado, big ski area, affluent area he grew up in, there's a certain part of town with really nice homes that get rented out in the winter when it's ski season. But in the summer, grass is overgrown. You know, it's not well taken care of, and it just is a reminder how important home ownership isn't just to people and family, but to the community as well. So I've already told that story once. I put it on a video going out there twice. I just think real stories um, can remind us that we are doing, dealing with real people behind these statistics, and maybe think about them as real people. It might help innovate more real ideas because... So so at the then mortgage, I, there wasn't much tech that I saw that was new or earth shattering or anything really. There wasn't anything except Palsian, which people are starting to pick up on anyway. So then I would have a then I would have a question for, for him after he tells that story, which is a great story, by the way. So I would so I would say that's a great story. I'm glad that the, the programs that you're helping to develop uh, for affordable housing are really good right now. So then why isn't there more participation? from Fannie, Freddie, or even somewhere in HUD, or somewhere at the Comptroller of Currency or something or somewhere like that to say, hey, you know what? We have this program that was developed in the 80s called the Community Reinvestment Act. And you can look at census tract, meaning that you can go to a postal area, not a zip code, but certain uh, census areas where there are low to moderate income. and if you go through right now, it's only offered through banking institutions, but if or 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 wholesale or or wholesale avenues through banking institutions, if they offer it, like it used to be, now I think U.S. Bank is going is offering it uh, wholesale through Union Bank in California. And so, if why why isn't the CRA? And I'm not asking you, Michael. I'm asking as a generality to our audience, to our listeners, and then to our industry. Why isn't the CRA being promoted? It's the Community Reinvestment Act, where you can get lower interest rates or uh, lower cost MI 
or you can have higher debt to income ratios because of um, uh, income qualifying where you have two or three, two or three people that are gainfully employed, or even in some circumstances, seven or eight people that are gainfully employed that are contributing to a household uh, and, and saying, Hey, you know, and, I'm, and when, when you say like um, uh, projects, I'm thinking of like lower income areas where you might have two or three families living in a three or four bedroom type of environment, even if it's only 1400 square feet, but they need a place to sleep and eat and, and make their family dinners or, or what have you. So why is it, so why isn't that program being promoted more? Why is why aren't more originators being informed about it? And 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 ultimately, why isn't there more uh, financial incentive from a lending institution? Because right now it's just not profitable. If it was profitable, that would be promoted. Why isn't there more financial incentive, either tax either tax wise to the uh, uh, to the bank so they can put it out in the wholesale community uh, or the broker community? Uh, or in the retail banking community, so that they can act, so that affordable housing can actually be done, and not, and it's not just FHA, but it could be other programs, which you still need full documentation and the ability to repay for. So why isn't why aren't more programs like that being offered? And I'm not asking you, Michael. I'm just I'm just ranting <laughs> because I know that there are programs that are like that that are, that are out there right now. They are just not out there being promoted, and I and it. And I and I feel sad for for cons- for general um, homeowners that are just not aware of programs like that, that are available. Because if you go to a, a, a small community bank who ha- who's offering the CRA product, then they'll say, "Hey, yeah, you know, is there something?" And and maybe uh, maybe a, a newer a newer uh, licensed bank originator who's at like small town ba- regional bank of Iowa say, "Oh yeah, we have this." Community Reinvestment Act program. Why don't you just? Why don't they, oh yeah, you're going to buy in this area. Yes, we have a special program for you. They have to walk into the bank and do that. But you know, I, I just don't see uh, lower income people doing that. They just not asking the right financial questions. They're, they're we're not designed in school to to ask financial questions. We're designed in school to ask more questions about our life and where are we going with our career, but not asking questions about finance. So yeah, it didn't, there was a talk about how it's like how help can be done on different panels that you know at that digital mortgage which i thought found mm-hmm. very cool i actually walked out with saying and i don't know if it was just to have to be some pent up people that have not presented in a long time that got the chance and did some profound things but there certainly was a lot of talk about what we're just saying and i think that's where all the opportunity is right now. and i think a couple more months if rates don't go um down <laughs> That's where people are going to have to start working, rolling up their sleeves and, and getting there. And there was another one who will make more money in 2020 loan officers or digital marketing. And I don't think anybody gave a definitive answer, but it was a it was a cool panel in the idea that there is a lot more data out there on people. And how do you want to use that data to help people? And I think what I learned is. There is a ton of data that the mortgage companies could have access to. I think there's a big gap on what to do after you contact that person. Um, how do you nurture it? How do you get your loan officers to buy in that it's worthwhile? Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't know if there are any solutions there exactly. If it'll just eventually jump to just, you know, gen- generative chat, AI chat, or if somebody actually will figure it out. I don't even know if it's like profitable business to come up with a CRM built specifically for longer nurture. But I was talking with somebody with a platform, um, you know, looking for some some loan partners, but the realtors on their their site close more deals than any other site um, public website out there. But the mortgage leads just never convert because one, you're fighting a little bit against the realtor where you should just be you know, working with them. And two, mm-hmm. It just takes longer and they don't control the loan officer as much or the loan officer's mindset isn't the same as the realtors, it seems, we don't, of the, staying the, in touch the, with people over time. The Mortgage Bankers Association does not have the same amount of media or uh, or political clout as NAR. And they, and and they by far don't have the capital either. NAR has way more capital. Right, because of all their membership dues and 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 the, and 
you know, if you ask a, an average originator, are they a member of the MBA versus a realtor who has joined NAR, the, the percentage of, of, of realtors joining NAR versus the amount of, of uh, originators joining the MBA is, is got to be staggering. More people, more yeah. realtors join I mean, that's NAR what than... I'm... Yeah, that's what the M, uh, the Mortgage Action Alliance is for. I mean, not the A yeah, as far as being the equivalent of NAR. Um, yeah, it's, it's, NAR is definitely a lot bigger than MBA. I mean, MBA is going to be a little hurt, but you need them. If one of the two doesn't figure out what to do about this flood insurance. Oh, yeah. With the government Senator shutdown, Melendez. I think it's only 13. Yeah, well, Senator, Senator Melendez is, is a part of that. He, he's part of, he's being indicted for, for being bribed with gold bars and working with Cuba and all that other stuff. And he's, and he's a critical member on whether that, that, that whole flood insurance thing is supposed to go through or not. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that. That sounds easy. You got any more information there? I, I can add that it would equate to 1300 closings a day would not happen if they don't figure that out. And I know it's been extended 25 times since 2017. So they usually figure it out. Yeah. So I want to digress just for a moment when you were talking about, was there any conver topic of conversation on trigger leads? Because you're talking about the difference between digital marketing and marketing for originators. So, and then previously we had talked about, uh, you know, FICO, uh, Fannie and Freddie using FICO 4 and FICO 5. But along those lines, was there any talk be uh, about um, the credit, the, the, three, the, the three credit scoring companies selling trigger leads to other um, originators who want to buy these trigger leads. Um, you know, as we talk about marketing, things like that. The, the, I, Katie Denson, who's a, a reporter uh, over at America, she's, she's, she's in the middle, she put in a post on LinkedIn in the middle of writing an article. In fact, yesterday was the last day of her actually wrapping up that article, talking about trigger leads. And so since they're on FICO 4 uh, for Fannie and FICO 5 for Freddie, and how they're reporting and how phone numbers are, and how uh, information is being collected and stuff. Was there any talk about trigger leads and how that's being, uh, and how that's going to be uh, bought and sold in the future at all? If it, if it wasn't, then we'll just continue forward. But I'm curious about it. From a lender's perspective, you know, lenders don't like them. But uh, one gentleman said that they see um, he's the owner of Insta Mortgage. But yeah. he said, you got to get ahead of the, the trigger. If you're waiting on the trigger, you've waited too late. You need to know those. You need to know that your borrower is is looking before a trigger tells you. And if you do, you shouldn't have to worry about triggers. You should already have them. And that's really around those D's. So death, divorce, diamond, which means marriage, dog. I think new pet. Um, I don't miss it. Like one or two more. Must be something for kids. Uh, dependents. You know, sure. and getting your database and figuring out how to, to get ahead of those trigger leads. However, the CRA, I think, is all for trigger leads. Obviously, they make money off of it. And if they eliminated it altogether, the argument, though, is, I know we had this down at the advocacy conference. If they eliminate it altogether, the rates would go up. How, how, is, uh, how is capital markets pricing of mortgages? How does that when you say rates, do you mean interest rates or do you mean price of credit reports going up? Interest rates would go up a little bit because believe the trigger allows the CERC, you know, whoever owns the mortgage, a little bit more security on being able to retain it in that portfolio and retention drives, uh -huh. drives value, drives rates. So a more expensive um, or bigger risk and risk equals rates. So they, yeah, rates would go up if the servicer did not have the ability to so... know that people are going to be falling out of their portfolio. So it would reduce the amount of mortgage convexity, or the amount of of uh, you know, if you're if you're a, if you have a consumer direct division like like a Mr. Cooper or, or something like that, then then the the that interest rate will remain on the books. It'll stay in the portfolio longer versus being paid off, refinanced, or or uh, or, or some other thing happening to that loan. Right? Yeah, and I think exactly. it's like bigger. Yeah, I think it's become like part of the system. Like it's built into the numbers. So if you vacuumed it out of there, I think everything would go up a little bit. That's what I've heard. So you almost want to argue that triggers, but like the server can still get the trigger. I think is one way the NBA might start looking into it as, as if a bill gets out there. I mean, it's still a ways away. I, I think there's one bill out there right now that was introduced in uh, April. Uh -huh. well, there's one bill in the House and one proposed bill in the Senate. So both of those will go through and then they'll massage. I think that'll be a talking point to the NBA to let servicers continue to 
get a trigger if if somebody's there. Hmm. By the way, Michael, it's something we didn't do, but we normally do. This is more talk. We this is our, your weekly real estate and mortgage radio show where we talk about what is going on in the real estate and mortgage industry. Uh, this these last forty five minutes, we've been talking about what where Michael Keller is at. He is in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, at the uh, Digital Mortgage Conference and his experience and on the panels. Michael, we didn't even talk about who you actually had a chance to talk to one to one on and maybe some and dishing out some of the 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 good tea that's out there in in mortgage land that's not in the conference uh that uh, so did you did you have any private conversations uh afterwards or was there any like small breakout sessions that maybe you didn't want to go to because it was like a three o'clock session and people were out um uh networking slash drinking partying i guess um did you did you happen to do have any private conversations or go to a small breakout session that maybe other people didn't go to that you thought, hey, wait a second, this is something that we should be listening to uh, in order to to glean some more information from that conference. Is there anything that you can give to us or did you happen to to get any information that's like that at the at Digital Mortgage? I was able to get two object objectives, which was find access to a source of getting lenders more loans that other people don't have access to. And okay. one was um, working on something with, um, sorry, working on something with figure, right. And okay. how can I bring that to other lenders? Because right now it's only companies like cross country who are doing well, even their owners are using figure. So the other one was this website that is really looking for a lender to partner up and it went so well, you know, there's banks in, um, Canada that gave over $300 million for the exclusive right for the same mortgage program. So it's just figuring it out in, the United States. And I went to almost every seminar though. I, it was an unbelievable conference. I did get to meet um, the president of TMC, uh, which the was super cool. She is. Or something else. You didn't, the, you yes, the mortgage about the collaborative. Mortgage. Got it. And that was, um, yeah, that, I really enjoyed that. Um, and one of the ones that was really cool, and I think what we'll do is We'll make this a 55 minute show. So five more minutes to go. If you're out there in the audience, um, I'm going to make sure I make a pl plane as I fly back. But I am going to tell you that one of the cooler presentations, optimizing mortgage operations in the world, mortgage M&A, Aaron Langevin, who I got to speak to after privately for a while, but it was only because I saw her on stage and she um, spoke about companies and it, if you wonder why Gil was able to acquire you know they started with RMS but they got legacy out of New Mexico Cherry Creek out of Colorado yes Atlanta out of Wisconsin the details she goes into that they take seriously in their MA was fascinating like I thought it was so cool like you need to have a 60 day before M like you acquire a company a 60 day after every department they have required to come up with a acquisition plan so if they acquire another company, the head of every division has to, every branch has to come up with some sort of acquisition plan. So, and it went on and on and on about how they have real, real systems. So I can see when they go into a company and they're choosing between three mortgage companies, they're already off to a lead. And I think that was a takeaway that has little to do with digital and more to do with an interesting topic I've not heard before said in an elegant, elegant way, like she did before as well. Like, just makes you think about everything. Do you have 60 day before, 60 day after plans? Do you have an Excel sheet systems to you bring on a new branch or, or bring on a, a new company? Um, she talked about what to be, you know, being the acquirer and acquiree. Uh, so that was, that was cool. You know, she said, uh, you got to know your, you got to know your flow so that you can say it to them. You got to have uh, some sort of culture for them. It's positivity. They, the company coming in has to be willing to change their mindset you need to work. You need to be ready, like have a development team. This one was really cool too. So you need like a development team to be ready and the opportunity to listen because you're going to get a lot of people coming from the new company saying, how come we don't have a button for this? When we used to do this, how come that doesn't happen? When we used to pull credit, you know, it used to go this way. They have a full dev team ready to make sure that they are able to nail a couple of those wins for the new company. And then they involve the processor, whoever's idea it was. They have them pilot. They have them do the UAT testing. And then they then okay. become so, an expert. 
So, so through all these processes and, and so on and so forth, I mean, for every home point that we hear about, for every Cherry Creek that we hear about that's being acquisitioned or, mer- or merged into a, a larger organization, how, did, was it ever asked, how many companies are, are they actually, did they actually look at versus actually make an acquisition? Was it like for every one in four, every one in six uh, that they look at, you know, you'll, they'll look at six and buy one? Uh, was that ever asked? Or was that I'll more, try and get that. No, there was no that time for that one. That one in particular. The second day was a little behind, so there wasn't much time for questions. So there sure. was no questions. I mean, for... Okay. And by the way, I know that you're at the that you're at this that everybody you know there's this huge room, and right? not every question can be asked or answered, right? And not only that, you're still trying to network in between in between the sessions. <laughs> yeah, you also don't want to make the person uncomfortable if they are a top player as well so yes. some of the people we mentioned are i'm not saying that's an uncomfortable question maybe it is maybe it isn't you never really know until you're in the room i mean you've been there you're fearless in your questions but yeah you were able to cultivate some good ones um you just yeah. don't want to look like you're asking a question to to ask a question i'll leave on this because I, I do have to run and then you do the outro here mike about tell everybody how they can come back we do have a new youtube station everybody too uh to watch shows or listen to them if you catch them live Somebody did ask a question for, to Joe Waylu. Really has everything he does together, scripted uh, down to a T. He's in marketing, so he excels at that piece. And I had never seen it before, so to happen to Joe was kind of. Um, so somebody said they were like they they, uh, they did ask a question, and they were like, "I'm from the you know New Mexico Gazette, like just some random Gazette." And then he was it, he was like, "Yeah, there's a new." Um, New website called Lender World that has seventy percent of all the purchase leads in the entire country. And Joe's he just never asked the question. He was just advertising his his Lender World. And by the, then once Joe figured it out, he just moved right on, like and gave him a look. But it was I've been to many conferences and I haven't seen anybody break that etiquette in a, in a long time. And it was it was it was kind of amusing that somebody would do that and do it in that way. Like just caught it so off guard. I thought he worked for him. Some sort of gazette that was it was the best advertising really was free advertising sometimes for people right <laughs> i mean i told the story four more times so it worked um yeah seriously well shocker. okay so michael thank you for giving us this update of digital mortgage you know we're i mean i'm i'm grateful that you went so that not only can we get the good tea of what was going down give us a rundown of of several days of information but also give us some insight of some of the things that w- that we talked to some of the C-suite executives about uh, when it comes to the the use of products, what are they doing in order to create efficiencies? And as we talk to other even originators that are out there right now, I didn't even get a chance to go into some of uh, some private conversations I've had with um, smaller originators and IMBs around the, the the U.S. of what are they doing differently in comparison to what you have seen at Digital Mortgage. Um, maybe we can talk about that on our next show. But uh, let's do our outro right now so that you can wrap up and get on the plane and get back home to see your family. So this is the More Talk Digital Mortgage Recap Show as we talk as we do this every week at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time, where, we, where this is the place where we talk about what uh, the questions that we maybe shouldn't be asking or maybe some questions that, or some of the questions that we should be asking to some of our leaders in the mortgage industry, finding out a little bit more about how we can improve our trade, our industry, and help each other out so that we can grow as an industry. So trying to, as we uh, navigate through this uh, very interesting time, let's see what happens with the government uh, over the course of the weekend, whether they shut down or not, whether the the United Auto Workers strike will, will actually create something for ourselves and whether the stock market is going to react positively or negatively and if so if the pot if the stock market reacts negatively will there be a purchase in the mortgage-backed securities as a flight as a flight to safety we will wait and see today i saw that we were up 46 basis points um when i got my text so that's interesting but join us next week as we talk a, a little bit more about what's going on if you have any questions feel free to reach out to michael or myself we're open on linkedin or via text um this week's been kind of crazy for me for and also for michael we'll do the best we can to get back to you all right michael uh thanks for joining us and with that we'll be able to shut down the room in the show as soon as you allow us to